All right, it's a sincere guide. Okay, so I'm at Rutgers University. Okay, to know that to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, that is that is to have succeeded. Ralph Waldo Emerson. I'm going to start this talk with something that I have never done before. Now, this young man um, has a congenital myopathy, and he was able to walk gingerly at the age of about 30, but he developed an abscess in his colon, um, and uh, he tolerated the pain for 18 months, couldn't take it any longer. So he uh, said to his surgeon, okay, you know, operate on me. He failed two extubation attempts uh, and got trached. Uh, for five months, they said to this man, why don't you want to breathe? Why do you want to be sick? Why do you want to spend your life in a nursing home? Why don't you want to breathe? Look, your oxygen saturation is 99%. Why do you want to be sick? For five months, he heard this. This is a doctor of clinical psychology, a very bright man. Uh, they didn't understand that if your vital capacity is not adequate, you're simply too weak to breathe. And this is not the first time this has happened. When people got polio in the 50s, they actually took children out of iron lungs, put them in automobiles, drove them around saying, don't think about your breathing. Don't think about it. Enjoy the scenery. As though people with low vital capacities uh, can simply uh, breathe when they actually don't even have enough vital capacity to cover a tidal volume. This is critical care doctors in Florida, right? So they, after five months, they said to him, there's nothing we can do for you. So we're going to send you to a nursing home near where your parents live in Hackensack, New Jersey. So they sent him to the hospital where he was put into the um, uh, critical care unit in Hackensack. And the critical care doctors there told him the same thing. Why don't you want to breathe? Why do you want to be sick? Why, why do you want to spend your life in a nursing? Why don't you look? Your oxygen is 98%. Now, if you guys are listening in, go to the street and meet anybody on the street and say to them, gee, I have this friend who doesn't want to breathe. He just wants to be sick and spend his life in a nursing home. What will the people on the street think of you? Well, first, they'll think you're crazy. What human being actually thinks that there's another one that doesn't want to breathe? Now, you can have Andine's curse and have no drive to breathe, but he's over 30 years old. He has a drive to breathe, he, but it's just incredible. Not only did the Hackensack doctors say this to him, like in Florida, but they called in his 60-year-old mother, and four or five of these critical care doctors said to the mother, your son doesn't want to breathe. He wants to be sick and spend his life nursing. So the mother said to him, she said, you know how much I love you, but I can't encourage a son of mine who doesn't want to breathe and wants to be sick. So if you go to the nursing home, I'm not going to visit you. So that week that he was going to the nursing home, she found out about us. We took out his trach tube and he weaned to nighttime nasal ventilation, went back to work 16 years ago. And he's back in Florida working full time and only using the ventilator overnight. But the point is, is that trach tubes make you much more difficult to wean, uh, make you more dependent on the ventilator. And 50 to 80 percent of people on trach ventilation, including ALS patients, die because of complications of the trach tube not because of the ALS or any other neuromuscular condition directly. And I'll be happy to explain that further. Now, I said to this man, I read, he sued the doctors in Florida and uh, I read what he wrote. And I said to him, can I use what you wrote for the foreword of my book? And he was delighted. So I put him in there as the foreword of my book. This book uh, is just out now. Now, this young girl on the book is a 29 year old with SMA type two. She had never used the ventilator, but she got a cold, couldn't cough, got pneumonia, went to the hospital, got intubated and trached. She woke up with the trach tube, unweanable, outraged at having a tube through her neck. They raised $25,000, transferred her to us. We took her trach tube out. She weaned off the ventilator entirely after they failed to wean her for five months and went back to work as a school teacher in Santa Barbara, California. A few months later, I was lecturing in San Francisco. They drove her up nine hours to thank me for taking that tube out of her neck. And that was a couple of years ago. That was while Santa Barbara was burning, actually. <clears throat> um, three messages to take away. Muscle strengthening requires rest and exercise. SIMV, PAV, and low span BiPAP do neither. CPAP is useless when your muscles are weak. And oxygen is counterproductive and no substitute for non-invasive ventilatory support. When you try to wean somebody on SIMV with descending pressure support, they're never resting and you're constantly making them struggle to get air, which is why they're anxious. If they're anxious, it's because they're short of breath because you're not resting their muscles. And if you rest their muscles and take out their invasive tubes, they will wean. Number two, no one needs a trach tube for being too weak to breathe. I mean no one. And I'm going to prove it to you. 
before I'm done here, you are going to be totally convinced that nobody ever needs a trach tube because their vital capacity is zero. It is much easier to extubate unweanable patients, even with zero milliliters of vital capacity, than to remove their tracheostomy tubes for uh, several reasons, which I hope to get into. What is NIV? NIV has come to mean CPAP and bi-level po uh, positive airway pressure at low spans. However, the last couple of years, they're starting to use BiPAP at spans of over 20 centimeters of water for COPD patients. And now they're starting to, because doctors never used BiPAP at, at ventilatory support settings, they started to, they've started to use volume targeted bi-level. With volume targeted bi-level, you can set a volume that will deliver a good tidal volume but the pressures, maximum pressures are always 25 or 30 and minimum pressures much lower. The point is, is that if you gave the BiPAP at a span of 20 centimeters water in the first place, you'd be doing ventilatory support, but nobody ever did, nobody here ever did that. I see people being extubated to BiPAP of eight and four all the time, or 10 and five or 12 and five. That's not resting their muscles, that's not ventilatory support. So now BiPAP is actually being used at ventilatory support settings, but I don't use AVAPs, or IVAPs, or volume-targeted BiPAP because you can't get a deep breath with it and the lungs shrink. Also, the EPAP is counterproductive and actually a little bit harmful for patients with neuromuscular conditions, not for trach tube patients, not for COPD patients, but when you have neuromuscular condition, it can actually be harmful. Dr. Cresciamano published a beautiful paper on using BiPAP for bulbar ALS. Then she turned off the EPAP by switching to an active circuit and a non-vented nasal interface, and everything was better. Blood gases, sleep quality, synchrony with the ventilator, uh, less uh, 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 intrathoracic pressure, um, uh, less GERD, and so on. So NIV is CPAP and BiPAP, which I won't use. However, non-invasive non ventilatory support is another matter. It is intermittent positive pressure ventilatory support at full ventilatory support settings. All of my patients want 1,100 to 1,300 milliliters of air, with very few exceptions. Uh, they start at about 700. I always write a range of about 650 to 1,500. And the respiratory therapist who's trained to do this goes to the patient, and the patients decide what volumes they want to use. I prefer volume so that the patients can air stack consecutively delivered volumes of air so that they can do lung volume recruitment and expand their lungs way beyond their inspiratory capacities. Uh, you can also give non-invasive ventilatory support at pressure preset ventilation of about 20 centimeters of water. Um, uh, for Even for babies or for adults, it's the same thing. Whether you give volume or pressure, you want to give full ventilatory support for sleep so that they rest it overnight and it normalizes their blood gases during the day and they don't need to use a ventilator during the day, uh, provided that their vital capacities are at least 250 milliliters of air. Anybody with 250 milliliters of vital capacity, which is about 5% of predicted, will not need a ventilator during the daytime, provided that you rest their muscles overnight by using ventilatory support settings like I'm telling you. You can do it with bi-level, but you got to give spans over 15 centimeters of water, you know, like 24 and four or something like that. But like I said, I only use this um, uh, when I have no choice. I mean, in third world countries, which the United States has become, I suppose we can use the cheaper BiPAP. But if you do, you got to use it at support settings. Okay. How long can non-invasive ventilation support be effective? Well, right now, my SMA1 patients who have been zero vital capacity since infancy are approaching 30 years of age. None of them are getting trach tubes. My Duchenne patients over 30 years, I've got four now over 50 years of age on 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support for almost 30 years. My polio patients who came out of iron lungs in 1954, I still have some of them on 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support on mouthpiece positive pressure ventilatory support since 1957 when my mentor, Dr. Augusta Alba, put 257 of these patients, took them out of iron lungs 24 hours a day, put them on mouthpiece ventilation, and they refused to go back into the iron lungs. I have ALS patients for over 10 years on non-invasive ventilatory support 24 hours a day. All my myopathic and lower motor neuron disease patients never need tracheostomy tubes. Okay, so here's the proof. Michael here, the older boy, when, when he was four months old, uh, when he was eight months old, uh, he was put on nasal ventilation. 
he was actually on BiPAP at four months, but I switched him to nasal ventilatory support when he was eight months old, became continuously dependent on it by nine or 10 months of age. Um, uh, uh, and, he, and I told his parents that he'd be dead within one year without a trach tube because um, he has really no muscles below the neck or above the neck. Uh, he's had an NG tube since four months of age, can take nothing by mouth since four months of age. But mom got pregnant, had another boy who's been 24 hour dependent on nasal venatory support since four months of age. I put him on nasal venatory support at, for sleep at four months of age. Within two weeks, he could not come off of it. He was dependent on it 24 hours a day. Um, uh, that was in 1995. There they are in 2010. There they are now about a few months ago. Uh, they're 27 and 25 years old now. They have no muscle movement at all, except for eye blink and a couple of millimeters of eye movement for the older boy, and not even eye blink for the younger boy. Only a, a couple of millimeters of eye movement. That's all the muscles they have. They don't have trach tubes. They've had zero vital capacity for over 20 years, and they don't want to die. And their parents take them fishing to Yankee ball games, to, to Broadway musicals, they take them out all over the place. Father is a lawyer and mom is just wonderful. Anyway, uh, by the way, the younger one became 24 hour dependent on nasal ventilatory support at four months of age without ever going to a hospital. The only time he's ever been hospitalized for any respiratory condition, he was nine years old, he got pneumonia. We intubated him for about a week to 10 days, then extubated him back to nasal ventilatory support and he went home. The older boy also was only hospitalized for respiratory problems once at the age of 12. Uh, when he got pneumonia, got intubated, and then we extubated him, sent him back home. Uh, however, in August, of, in August of 21, he got pneumonia again, was intubated again. And after four or five days, we prepared him for extubation. And we extubated him back to non-invasive ventilatory support. And for the first time in the 300 people we've extubated, to, with, with little or no vital capacity, his airway closed in 15 minutes and he had an emergency tracheotomy. His mother was uh, frantic. I said to Michael, I said, listen, Mike, I want you to write an article with me. If you prefer to have the trach, that's okay with me, but I want you to say why. If you wanna get the trach out, we'll take it out. But again, I want you to say what you prefer and why. In the 1990s, I surveyed 720 ventilator users both trach and non-invasive for what they preferred. They had experience with both trach and non-invasive ventilation. And basically everybody preferred non-invasive support and 70% of those who had trachs wanted to get, find someone to take the trachs out. At any rate, um, he was trached in August of 21. In February of 22, we removed his tracheostomy tube. Zero vital capacity since infancy. Uh, we removed this tracheostomy tube, and this is the thing of interest. We did it in his home. We, we usually remove trach tubes in the outpatient clinic, on rare occasions in the hospital. But his mother was so good, plus they had two nurses there. We removed this trach tube in his house, even though he has zero muscle movement and zero vital capacity. Um, this is another with spinal muscular atrophy type one. Now, I know you guys, most of you listening are adult pulmonologists and so on, but these patients are adults now. This is an SMA type one who I said would be dead in one year without a trach. Now he's 30 years old uh, and uh, 30 years of age, he's an adult. Uh, so you're going to have to you know, see these patients because they don't, they don't die. If you don't trach them, they don't die. Uh, Duchenne, um, in, a, in, a, in northern Japan, a doctor read my, one of my articles. She stopped traking patients. Uh, the patients with Duchenne died at the average age of 18.6 before she traked them. When she traked them, they all died at the average age of 29. Uh, and then when she read my article in 1993, she hasn't traked one since. Uh, and she now has 150 of them. And their average survival is to 40 years of age. So 10 more years without a trach than with a trach. And what they die from is heart failure most of the time. This is the first patient with Duchenne that I saw on non-invasive ventilatory support put on that by my mentor, Dr. Alba. Uh, here he was 14 years old when he became 24 hour vent dependent, but he was on mouthpiece ventilation for sleep at the age of 12, the most severe Duchenne case I've ever seen actually. 
And here he is, 41 years old, 27 years after on 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support uh, at 41 years. Now, this man here is 52 years old with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, 24-hour event dependent since he was about 24. And this woman is now 78 years old. She came out of an iron lock in 1954, has been on 24-hour non-invasive positive pressure since then, since 1957 on mouthpiece ventilation. This is an ALS patient. Uh, I have a video of him uh, using his ventilator to blow out his birthday candles. 14 years of 24-hour nasal ventilation. This is a spinal cord patient whose trach tube we removed in 1992. Um, and um, she uses mouthpiece ventilation uh, and nasal ventilation at night now, uh, since 1992. Um, this is another spinal cord patient who, whose vital capacity was decreasing. And when he got below 750, he became short of breath. So they, in Pennsylvania, they put a chest shell on him and ventilated him with a chest shell. But he got transferred to us. Our neurosurgeons put on a halo brace. And to do that, they needed access to his chest. So I put him on nasal ventilation, let him try that, let him try a mouthpiece, let him try a lip seal, remove the chest shell. You could see his pressure ulcer from the chest shell. And then the neurosurgeon got the idea to attach the mouthpiece lip seal to the poster on the poster. And it worked beautifully. His vital capacity went down to as low as 200 milliliters. But after about a week, he went back up over 800 and weaned off the ventilator completely, never developed airway secretions because he did not get intubated or trached. And he went home. He went to rehab at Kessler, actually. This is morbidly obese. It was 450 pounds. Uh, we actually extubated him, although he was unweanable. And twice we removed trach tubes from his neck, even though he was unweanable. He went five years on 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support, five years on overnight and some daytime non-invasive ventilatory support. And uh, he died from uh, a skin problem. Excuse me one second. Yes, hi, hi. I'm doing a, a lecture. Yes. Yes, keep him there till six. Right, right, okay, right. I'll, I'll be over, yeah, bye. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's the Connecticut patient. I gotta go back and see later, okay. So, um, um, now, in 2010, 22 centers from 18 countries got together, and we put together data on 760 24-hour event-dependent patients, non-invasive support, with only three diagnoses, Duchenne, SMA type 1, and ALS. And uh, so, as I mentioned before, myopathies and lower motor neuron patients never need trach tubes to prolong survival. Um, upper motor neuron patients usually do whether they have traumatic brain injury, stroke, or ALS, or CP, uh, if they have spasticity, they close to the upper airway so that the cough assist exsufflation flows do not exceed 130 or 140, they need trach tubes to get their secretions out. Now, understand something. If you've got a severe, a, 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 a chronic vegetative state patient, or a severe stroke, uh, you know, basically chronic vegetative, if you clear their airways, they wean instantaneously. But what you have to do is turn off the oxygen and use the cough assist at 70 centimeters of water pressure through their trach tubes every, as, as much as possible, every hour, every two hours. And their oxygen saturation level will become normal in room air uh, within a couple of days, sometimes immediately. But you've got to turn off the oxygen, use the cough assist through the tube at 70 centimeters of water. And you got to do it enough until the saturation becomes normal. And at that point, most of these patients will breathe entirely on their own. We had three patients in our hospital for over one year thought to be unweanable because nobody shut off the oxygen. And every time they lowered the SIMV pressure support, the patient started breathing 50 times a minute. I told the nurse, listen, you don't put that patient back on the ventilator until the oxygen saturation goes below 95. And more than half the time, it doesn't go below 95. And they are weaned instantaneously, but you keep the vitamin O off, no supplemental oxygen. Ugh. And when you put them back on the bench, you do it for an hour or two, and then you take them off and do another sprint if necessary. But most of these patients wean just by shutting off the oxygen and normalizing their saturation by clearing their airways and their atelectasis with the cough assist. And this is one such patient that we did this to. 
Now, I haven't got time to go into finances here, but you know, before COVID, we were spending almost four trillion dollars for healthcare. One trillion of it was for administrative costs. You know, like the Supreme Court, these uh, characters who know nothing about medicine, but who are killing women who are pregnant because they think, well, they think they know what they're doing, and obviously they don't. But that's just one example of how bureaucrats are wrecking the medical profession today. I doubt that many of you, if any of you, would argue with me on this point. But if you do, then read my next book, which is going to be for the public anyway, about the waste. By the way, China provides health care for one and a half billion people for $660 billion, which is little more than half of what we pay for administrators and the insurance companies, okay? Uh, they provide health care for five times more people than in our country, for half of what we pay for administration, okay? That's just one thing that you'll see in my next book if I ever get to finish it. Um, <clears throat> Oh, uh, the population and the number of doctors has increased by 50% in the last 50 years. The number of administrators has increased by 3,200%. Three aspects to management, long-term non-invasive management, extubation and decannulation to non-invasive support. How we evaluate every patient that comes to our MDA clinic, we check their CO2, we check their oxygen saturation, we check their peak cough flows through a peak flow meter, but we have them cough through it, not exhale through it, like for asthmatics. And we have a, uh, a manual spirometer, forced vital capacity. In fact, PFTs is virtually useless for people with weak muscles because it's designed for people with airway obstruction and lung disease. None of, the peak, none of it is relevant for my patients with SMA or Duchenne or ALS, none of it unless you suspect severe pulmonary disease. They don't die from pulmonary disease. ALS patients, they die from trach tubes and ALS. Um, so PFDs now, the vital capacity sitting is of some interest, but it's of minimal interest compared to the vital capacity supine because most of these ALS patients and many others, like with many other conditions and myopathies, they can't breathe lying on their backs because their diaphragm is paralyzed and their vital capacity goes down by 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% when they lie down. But do they measure this in PFT labs? No, they don't even think of it. If you have a pulmonologist or anybody that knows enough to measure the sitting versus supine VC in any of these patients, then they won't send them to PFT labs anyway, because they don't need it. Another useless thing is polysomnography. And polysomnography is useless because the polysomnogram is programmed to interpret every event as being a central or obstructive apnea, not because the diaphragm is weak. But these patients do not need EPAP. They do not need a uh, PEEP. What they need is inspiratory volume and pressure to normalize their CO2s, keep them normal day and night. So uh, pulmonary function testing, like I said, is uh, really not necessary. Uh, bronchodilators and oxygen therapy is counterproductive. Now, bronchodilators are fine when they're sick. It may help when they're sick, but when they're well, these patients have cardiomyopathies and the bronchodilators are not really good for them. They all have tachycardia. Bronchodilators don't help. Oxygen therapy is actually harmful. In fact, if you put a patient on oxygen instead of a ventilator, they'll be back in the hospital sooner than if you do nothing at all for patients with Duchenne, ALS, and so on. Uh, polysomnograms, as I mentioned, doesn't recognize. You can use a polysomnogram to recognize muscle weakness, but you got to monitor CO2 or you got to monitor diaphragm uh, contraction by letting them swallow an electrode, which I haven't seen anybody doing. But it's not necessary anyway because you put the patient on full ventilatory support settings to rest their muscles during sleep. Then you don't have to worry about repeating this. If you titrate away apneas and hypopneas, you're not giving them respiratory muscle rest they're still struggling to breathe. You want to rest their muscles at night with adequate settings, not titrate away apneas and hypopneas. Uh, and as I mentioned, I reported in 1998 that the outcomes of giving oxygen to these patients is worse than doing nothing at all. Uh, not only does the oxygen uh, turn off their hypoxic drive so that their CO2s go up much higher, but it makes the oximeter useless as a gauge of ventilation, airway secretions, and lung disease. I tell my patients that you use your cough assist for every desaturation below 95%. And if you can't keep your baseline normal, you've got to go to the hospital because a mucus plug can cause you to arrest. 
and they need antibiotics, they've got pneumonia and so on. But you don't give them oxygen at home and you only give them oxygen when you're ready to intubate them. Uh, and uh, they need to only go to the hospital generally when their baseline saturation stays less than 95, despite using their ventilator and oxygen. Uh, so there are inspiratory and x-ray muscles for coughing and the bulbar innervated muscles. Nobody needs inspiratory or expiratory muscles for, for surviving because the non-invasive ventilatory support is for the inspiratory muscles, the cough assist for the expiratory support, but we cannot uh, replace the bulbar innervated muscles. However, you don't need them either if you're positioned properly to drool instead of to aspirate. As the vital capacity goes down, the cough flows go below 40% of normal and become ineffective. And then you need to do manually assisted coughing and so on. I'll show you. Uh, the goals are lung volume recruitment, optimize cough flows, and maintain normal ventilation. Uh, this is a baby. All babies with paradoxical breathing, where when the diaphragm contracts, Contra the belly goes out and the chest wall sinks, uh, 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 sinks in. That's paradoxical breathing, and all those babies need non-invasive ventilatory support settings during sleep, or their lungs will not grow. They'll have funnel-shaped chests and develop pectus excavatums. When, a, when an SMA2 does not have paradoxical breathing, they usually do not need a ventilator except when they have a cold, and then they need it around the clock. Uh, this is what I mean by lung volume recruitment for a baby with SMA type 1. Now, when a baby cries, this is exactly what you see on the right. The chest expands, the baby cries, wah, and that's what causes the lungs to grow. These are those two brothers I showed you with zero vital capacity. We can put almost two liters of air into their lungs today because of the lung volume recruitment they got since they were babies. Does somebody have a question? Well, okay, uh, I'll have then continue. See, I'm wearing this uh, tie here. Um, you know, uh, I, I wear this to be fashionable. You know, that's a, a frog kicking a soccer ball because, you know, I figured that the Italian soccer team hasn't done well lately, but if they learn how to frog breathe, maybe they'll improve their, uh, you know, scoring opportunities. But now frog breathing or glossopharyngeal breathing um, can be so effective that I've had patients with zero vital capacity wake up at night, frog breathing, to discover that their ventilators weren't working anymore. And uh, if this had happened on trach ventilation, they could have died and they would have died if their low pressure alarms don't go off. But when you don't have a trach, you can frog breathe um, to high volumes if your bulbar muscles are good. Uh, like spinal cord patients are ideal, for example. Uh, frog breathing is simply using the tongue to piston air past the glottis and, and you can ventilate your lungs with seven or eight of these pistoning actions. And um, by the way, this is a sports medicine technique. Uh, because all Olympic world champion speed swimmers, uh, uh, sprint swimmers, are superb frog breathers. Uh, in one of the interplanetary conferences on glossopharyngeal breathing that took place in, um, in, um, uh, in northern Italy, in, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the town now, but um, it was about 15 years ago. And I was, I was actually an inter international uh, conference, but I thought if we called it interplanetary, some interplanetary frogs might come down and be interested in human breathing, but we didn't have any of those visitors. At any rate, um, there were a Swedish and Norwegian Olympic sprint swimmers that demonstrated they had vital capacities of seven to nine liters. And then they added five liters on top of that by frog breathing. 14 liters of air they put in their chest and they became so buoyant that they could swim faster and they could win the Olympics, okay? Also, when you do deep diving in the ocean, you go down 200 feet, you need as much air as possible. And there are people there that actually demonstrated reverse frog breathing to bring air up from the residual volume that they do when they're 200 feet below the ocean surface to equalize pressures across their eustachian tube so they don't lose consciousness. I'm telling you, it's absolutely incredible. But frog breathing can be so effective that people can do it all day long, even when they have zero muscles below the neck, I had a lawyer arguing cases in court by frog breathing, even though he was 24 hour event dependent. You cannot do that with a trach tube. Um, uh, this is a Duchenne patient who is 47 years old. Now you see his vital capacity went to zero. His um, uh, air stacking ability went to almost zero. Uh, 
Um, but no, I'm sorry, his frog breathing ability went to almost zero, but he was able to use it to take fewer mouthpiece ventilations until he was in his 40s. But his ability to air stack, holding those deep breaths to almost two, uh, two liters of air, continued until he died. And he, he died, his ejection fraction was under 15%. He died uh, suddenly, in, it wasn't respiratory. So uh, if a patient, um, we air stack the patient and measure the assisted cough flows. Um, uh, so a, a patient with a vital capacity of 900 milliliters can air stack to almost 3,000. And this permits him to increase cough flows and do lung volume recruitment. Now, this is a patient with zero vital capacity, 12 breaths, 500 milliliters, all by frog breathing. And he can do five big breaths of 1,600 milliliters. Um, now, cough flows are an important goal to increase cough flows. Um, and you do that because most of the patients die um, because they get pneumonia because they can't cough. Even 30% of people in nursing homes they die from pneumonia. And in large part, it's because their cough flows become ineffective. Um, so to cough, you need a deep breath, you need to create pressure, and you need to hold the air with the glottis. Um, so number one, we inflate the patient, and then we press on the belly and measure the assisted cough flow. And the assisted cough flows are ineffective, they become effective. And if I had to show one image why we never have to trach anybody, it's this one here because we can get effective cough flows with, and don't have to suction a patient through a tube. By the way, if you suction a patient through a trach tube, up to 92% of the time, you miss the left main stem bronchus anyway. The cough assist is non-invasive suctioning. Uh, and the cough assist creates over 10 liters a second of flow through both airways. It doesn't just prefer the right airway like a suction catheter. Uh, so that's a patient in Japan who got the, the cannulated. You have to use the cough assist, though, at 50 to 60 centimeters of water pressure through a mask or a mouthpiece, but 60 to 70 through a translaryngeal tube or a trach tube. Otherwise, you don't get optimal flows. We use it on babies, too, at the same pressures. Then The next goal is to maintain normal alveolar ventilation because these patients develop headaches, fatigue, hypersomnolence, decreased appetite, depression, so on. Uh, the indications for non-invasive ventilatory support are paradoxical breathing in babies and symptoms of hypoventilation. I've had ALS patients with 90% of normal vital capacity sitting who are 24-hour vent dependent. And I've had other ALS patients with 300 milliliters or 6% of normal vital capacity who had normal CO2s day and night and were asymptomatic and didn't use a ventilator. You cannot go by 50% uh, vital capacity put patients on ventilators. You, you got to treat your patient, not numbers on a device. And you treat the patients by listening for symptoms and looking at them. Uh, so again, um, we use for babies about 15 to 20 centimeters of water, inspiratory pressure, no EPAP uh, or no PEEP. For older patients with questionable symptoms, I measure their oxygen saturation and their CO2 during sleep. Uh, and if it's high and I think they have symptoms, I put them on nasal ventilation. I tell them if they don't want to use it, don't worry about it. We'll check you again next year. But if they feel better using it, they use it, and they always increase the volumes to about 1,100 to 1,300 milliliters, or they use pressures of about 20 centimeters of water. The, a weak diaphragm is exhausting, and it's like the patients complain of anxiety, and they can't sleep because they're struggling to breathe, but they don't tell you that. The ventilator is like a pickup truck, but you got to use it at full ventilatory support settings, not BiPAP. Uh, and um, the patients rest at night and they're fine during the day. Now, um, until they get weaker. Now, this is a multiple sclerosis patient, transverse myelitis. The vital capacity went to 100 milliliters. The first person, totally unable to breathe, who used nasal ventilatory support in 1984 in uh, here. Um, she said she was anxious, hadn't slept in three days. Her vital capacity was 250 milliliters. So I understood why. So I put her on a nasal mask because they had just come out that year, 1954, CPAP mask, covered the holes, gave her 900 milliliters. She exhaled 750 through the um, uh, exhalation valve into the spirometer. Uh, and she immediately fell asleep. I got a flashlight. I looked through her mouth. I saw the air was pushing the diaphragm against the back of the tongue sealing off the oropharynx. 
I, I thought she'd be de- de- die or get intubated that night. I came in in the morning. She's still using this. I said, why are you using this? I said, because I can't breathe without it, doctor. I rechecked her vital capacity. It was 100 milliliters. So I understood that she couldn't breathe. Um, and then after ACTH treatments, four days later, she got better. But then I thought to myself, well, there's not any difference between 100 milliliters and zero. So I went to two of my patients who had zero vital capacity. One was a polio patient, one a spinal cord patient. I asked them, I begged them, please, for one night, don't use a lip seal, use nasal ventilation. I went to their homes and I watched them all night. They never desaturated. They never even opened their mouths. Uh, and they were fine. They were fine. Excuse me. Yes, hello. Go back later. I don't know. I don't know. At any rate, in 1952, there were no iron lungs in Denmark. So in Denmark, they put trach tubes in, and the doctor I felt there, who had done a, 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 a mouthpiece um, ventilation with the doctor Cornon, he was. They were delivering uh, uh, medications to C, the COPD patients in 1946, 1947, using the Bird machine. And Cornon thought, well, what if we, instead of delivering secretions, we actually ventilated somebody with these birds or with an ambu bag, and we put the trach tubes in to do it. So in Denmark, that's what they did. And then when the surgeons in the United States heard they could put trach tubes in people, they tried to convince everybody to get a trach tube and come out of the iron lung. At Ranchos Los Amigos, the patients, uh, well, you see what Dr. Raphael said in 1954. He said, uh, you just hang the mouthpiece by the patients. They grip it with their lips when they want it. When they don't, they let it go. It's just too simple. I don't know why we didn't think of it earlier. In Ranchos and at uh, Goldwater, where I worked, excuse me. Yes, hello. Dr. Bell. Yeah, but you got to call me back. I'm giving a lecture. Yeah, so um, it's just, uh, anyway. So in Goldwater, when I went to Goldwater in 1977, patients have been using non-invasive ventilatory support 24 hours a day for 24 four years, 23 years, when I met them, and they're still doing it. And, and, and these patients now are getting trach tubes in, uh, like, uh, in, in clinics. And oh, So this is a patient on mouthpiece ventilation with a gooseneck clam from Radio Shack, a flexible metal support arm holding the mouthpiece by the mouth. This is the lip seal that patients used for many years, from 1964 until recently. Today, there's an oracle on the market that is a flange that goes in doesn't have straps, but delivers air through the mouth. A uh, patient using a, uh, this man is a tremendous story. I don't think I should even have time to take, tell you about this. But uh, anyway, some people have good strength, but they have no diaphragms and they can't breathe. They don't need trach tubes. Uh, we removed his trach tube and, and put him on a mouthpiece. He's an accountant. He worked for 15 years using a ventilator like this. Um, and um, um, and uh, then he died, uh, but he didn't die from respiratory problems. And this man is interesting. He, he had been intubated 19 times in 20 years, and he signed a, an advanced directive to not get intubated again. He had been in an explosion that destroyed his lungs. And um, he was breathing, agonal breathing. That's what he was doing. And he, and he didn't want to be, he was dying. And so I said to the pulmonologist, I said, well, you know, can we use non-invasive ventilation? I said, well, yeah, sure, you could do that. So we tried to ventilate him through the nose. All the air went out of the mouth. Then we put a lip seal on, forced the air into his lungs. The CO2 came down. He woke up and he went home for 11 months using non-invasive ventilation around the clock till he died 11 months later. This is an air sac for a pneumo belt. Pneumo belt goes on the belly. The sac is inside it, hooked up to the ventilator. The ventilator pushes against the belly, moves the diaphragm, ventilates the lungs all day. This even works for people with zero vital capacity. I've had patients with zero vital capacity using pneumo belts for 40 years, and it's back on the market. Any ventilator will inflate these things. Um, uh, you avoid intubation and respiratory failure by, by keeping your saturation 95% or more in room air. And you do that by using your cough assist every time secretions makes it go down. Of course, you may have to use a ventilator when you're sick if you've got neuromuscular conditions, and a vital capacity under a liter and cough flows under 270 liters a minute, you need a cough assist. But if you do this, most of the time, 90% of the time, you will avoid getting pneumonia and respiratory failure. Intubation and decannulation. Okay. The criteria for extubation are absurd. Adequate cough, few secretions, should tolerate low pressure support. For Come on, my patients can't do any of this. 
but we have 100% success rate extubating them. Um, um, our criteria are afebrile, normal white blood count, normal oxygen saturation of room air, normal CO2 on full ventilatory support if necessary, fully cooperative, and so on. And uh, this is in 1988, two months after I asked Jack Emerson to put the cough assist back on the market, he did. Well, he put it back on the market in 1993 when I helped him get it through the FDA. But in two months, he gave me this, this inexiflator, the prototype cough assist, in November of 1988. We immediately started using it to extubate people in critical care. This was a spinal cord patient from Poland. She fell down her daughter's steps, broke her neck. Her vital capacity went as low as about 200, 180 milliliters. And she was intubated, but we extubated her without traching her and used the cough assist to clear her airway secretions. Uh, this is an SMA1 who today is 29 years old using nasal ventilation. Oh, I'm showing you this because this girl was intubated five consecutive years for pneumonias from the age of four to nine. Then when she was 15, she got pneumonia, was intubated again. Um, and again, we prepared her for extubation by using the caucuses through the tube at 70 centimeters of water pressure, got her SATs normal in room air. And then the respiratory therapist and I stood at the foot of the bed and said to her mother, Homa, Homa, we've done enough work. You extubate your daughter. So in the pediatric ICU, we gave her a syringe, told her to take the air out of the cuff and pull the tube out. And she did. And then she did what she'd been doing for 15 years. She bagged her, used the cough assist, put her nose piece on in seven seconds and, and put on back on her ventilator. And you know, this girl now is 29 years old and hasn't been hospitalized in the last 14 years. Her mother extubated her. So if you've got critical care doctors in any country in the world, who want to see or know how to extubate an unweanable patient with zero vital capacity, Homer's mother can explain it to you. But I'm being facetious, of course, but the trick is not to extubate them, it's to prepare them for extubation by getting their SATs normal in room air by using the cough assist correctly through the tube and ventilating them. And anyway, that's, you know, Homer did this for her daughter. And this was when, you know, 15, 14 years ago. These patients, I told you they were intubated. Um, one was intubated twice, one once. Each time we were able to extubate them back to non-invasive support. This guy was intubated nine times with SMA type one uh, before he was four and a half years old. When he was 16 and a half, he got pneumonia again. Was, we intubated him just so he could sleep. The whole family was exhausted. For two weeks, they're using the coffices to try to keep his sats normal. We put him in the hospital, intubated him for 24 hours. Everybody slept. We extubated him back to non-invasive support. That was 11 years ago. No, 13 years ago. Now he's 29 years old. Uh, this is a woman with, um, with um, Nemlin rod myopathy. Twice we transferred her from Robert Woods Johnson Hospital where they wanted to trach her. And so uh, she was unweanable. She came to us. The first time we extubated her, she was three years old. The second time she was 27. And uh, this time, we had trouble because her mouth is so wide open. So we extubated her to a mask covering the nose and mouth, but it was hard to keep the mouth from slipping under the mask. So we didn't have a face mask. We got something called a new mask from a company in California. The new mask covers the entire mouth and foam blocks the nose. And thanks to that, we extubated her without having to trach her. Uh, this is it. This is the new mask here. And this is how we were able to successfully extubate her. Then she went back to nasal ventilation and she's been fine. Um, and uh, there she is. So now we had a, we've published our first paper on this in 2010, 157 intubated patients who couldn't breathe at all, failed all spontaneous breathing trust. Some had zero vital capacity. We succeeded in extubating all of them successfully to non-invasive ventilatory support, except I think for two who had ALS. Uh, these are the diagnoses, ALS, Duchenne, ICU myopathy, mu other muscular dystrophies, myasthenia gravis, post-polio, SMA, spinal cord, and other neuromuscular disease. And, um, and then we published another 98 cases in 2015. We also began the cannulating patients in 1990. Well, actually, Dr. Alba was doing it in 1967. Uh, and then I told you about her. She's the person who was transferred to us from Santa Barbara. Uh, outraged at having a trach tube. We took it out, sent her back to work as a full-time 
teacher. The breathenvs.com is the website with all the centers that do what we do. There's only a few in the United States, but uh, these are the centers that patients should be referred to if they don't want to, if they want their neck saved, literally and figuratively. Uh, this, I've had 12 books on this. Uh, my most recent book is this one, but I don't have any copies left right now. I'm trying to get the publisher to correct the mistakes it made in the first issue. Um, and then I'll have some more of these books available. Oh, that's my home address in case anybody wants one. But send me an email if you want one. Full money back guarantee. I'll tell you right now, my patients will never give this book up because I got two chapters on trach tubes, why they're never necessary for them and why trach tubes and how they kill you. And I got two chapters on these guidelines from the neurology and the pediatrics academies, why they're wrong. I use their words. I say exactly why all of them are wrong. None of these patients ever need tracheostomies. Okay, I'll leave it at that. If there's a little bit of time for uh, questions, I hope that there's a little time, but I'm nervous because my patient is in a, a building that they lock normally. And I'm gonna have to try to get in there and I hope my card will work there. I've never tried. Anyway, I'd love to answer questions if you have some questions and you know. So what do you think you guys? Yeah, Dr. Leeper, do you have a question there? I just saw you on mute. Well, I just, I was listening in the whole time, Dr. Baha, totally oh. brilliant talk. Um, <laughs> your passion and your humor and uh, your approach is amazing. It is, and I wanna just say, declare my bias, I'm a, a surgical intensivist. I do absolutely boatloads of tracheostomies, <laughs> almost, almost none for anyone like this. Ours are done for trauma patients who need pulmonary toilet or other other causes. Right. Um, but I love this approach. It's so yeah. different. It's so like paradigm shifting. It's so iconoclastic, and you know, and there's nothing worse than hearing another boring talk about this you know, <laughs> from people who believe the same thing you do and think and, and you repeat the same yeah. sort of like dogma. This is so unique, and this this select group of patients who have the right disease state and the right you know mindset and supports to get yeah. this kind of care Wrong. clearly have had a lifelong benefit from your your approach. So I just congratulate yeah. you on on Nick right. passion and sharing it with us. I got to tell you something: thirty percent of people in nursing homes die from uh, pneumonia, not mm -hmm. because they can't cough, but. 85 year olds walking around shuffling along with a cane, right, right, right. They're, they're healthy. They take care of themselves. They may be independent, but then what happens? They get bronchitis. Mm -hmm. They get a kidney stone. They get a urinary infection. They go to the hospital. They made NPO for diagnostic procedures, treatment procedures, mm -hmm. right? The nurses wake them up all night for vital signs. Then they, um, oh my God, uh, um, they lose one to 3% of their vital capacities per day in critical mm -hmm. care. And they lose 1% per year up from at the age of 20. Yes, hello, Dr. Bakhbar. This is incredible. I'll be back there in 15 minutes or so. Just don't let them lock the doors downstairs. I got to be able to get in, okay? All right, thanks. Bye, bye. Yeah, so anyway, um, uh, so what I want to tell you is that uh, older people uh, become deconditioned. This, this critical care neuromyopathy mm -hmm. can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. But nobody needs a trick. To, oh, let me give you an example of, 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 of an outrageous thing that has been going on. People get cabbage procedures, right? Sure, of course. And they freeze the phrenic nerves. Yeah. And the patients wake up and they can't breathe lying on their backs because their diaphragms don't work anymore. So they get traked. A few correct. years ago, I had a roly poly, which I think is not politically correct, lawyer come to me mm -hmm. with a trach tube. And he said, I haven't been able to work for a year because of this trach tube. That's what he said to me. And I want it out. So my criteria for removing a trach tube is coffices flows of at least 180 liters a minute because the airway is open if you get a good flow and mm -hmm. the airway is closed if you don't. And if the airway is closed, it could be reversible granulation tissue edema. I send them to ENT if the flows are low. But yeah. if the coffices flow is high, I just take the trach tube out, put the patients on non-invasive ventilation if they need it, and they go from there. Well, this guy, no way I could take his trach tube out. It was mm. almost completely obstructed above the tube. I sent him to ENT. Uh, he had a total obstruction. Thoracic surgery started sounding out his trachea to try yep. to open it up. The trachea, the trachea perforated and he died. And, and you know, this is a crime. He didn't need a trach tube in the first right. place. But, and this happens to so everybody with uh, con uh, congenital hypoventilation, so-called, none of them ever need trach tubes. Now, they and can also use phrenic pacemakers. That's true. Mm -hmm. But the pacemaker is an electronic ventilator. 
The pneumo belt is a mechanical ventilator. When they advertise pacemakers to get the patient off the ventilator, that's bull. The, the pacemaker can stop instantly at any time and you can't rely on it permanently. So ideally, if you put in a pacemaker, you should take out the trach tube, use nasal ventilation at night, teach the patient how to frog breathe. That's rehabilitation, not uh, leaving people with trach tubes so they don't get obstructive apneas when the pacemaker collapses the uh, thorax. Yeah, there's there's no doubt what you've identified there is a, a, really a fatal you know complication of tracheostomy. But as you've said a million times, there are much less exciting you know fatal or or at least high morbidities from tracheostomies. You know, avoiding that you know the upper airways, uh, putting that like a source of infection and introduction of bacteria sure. in the lower airways, oh, all the humidification of the upper airways. It's you know it's clearly a better mousetrap if possible with the right support, the right patients to do ventilation through their, their nose or, or their mouth is a better system. So you've shown that clearly, and I congratulate you on, on the work and, and you should run to get to your patient before they lock you out. But I really, yeah. that was a wonderful talk and very interesting to hear. So thank you very much. Uh, where do the Duchenne patients and ALS patients go when they so, get pneumonia? What, is, David, is, David, the is, David, is David on the call or Karen or someone yeah. from the EICU side be able to comment on that? Hi, oh, Steve. yes. How are you? <laughs> Dr. Bach, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk. I've uh, listened to you many times before. <laughs> um, we do have a, um, a neuromuscular group here, and uh, we do have a uh, respiratory care service that looks after our Duchenne's, um, and it's linked also to the neuromuscular neurologist. So uh, we try to provide the support uh, non-invasively um, and with cough assist, mouthpiece, um, but again, we do have uh, one or two patients over the years that have ended up and have chosen uh, tracheostomy over the non-invasive support. Um, so we don't. Uh, we we do have a few patients that um, that uh, ended up with tracheostomies and preferred that. Uh, but the one comment I wanted to make, because you're talking to a group of uh, of general intensivists, and um, uh, they look after all types of acute care patients from a yeah. respiratory perspective. But I think it's important from your talk today that you've really emphasized the, the skill, the art of learning about a different population that many intensivists don't see. Uh, right. Or they see, they, they don't really know kind of how to deal with them uh, as you've talked about. And uh, I think that's important. I think it's really important to get intensivists trained and to see to look after this population um, and get that experience because many of them don't see that. And so if you learn to build with a hammer, that's maybe all you use. And so a tracheostomy right. is very common uh, for these patients, the first thing that, that is reached for. And it's really important to appreciate some of the, 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 the features that you've really emphasized today. And I thank you for that. You know, Dave, Doug McKim, um, his patients almost never, I mean, they, according to Doug, they almost never get pneumonia and get go into acute respiratory failure. And he has tremendous success at, uh, you know, preventing these things. Um, and the critical care docs that work with him are like you. They, they, I, I get the impression that they succeed in getting them extubated most of the time. Um, um, and the, the, Doug is on our website. And and Kate and uh, uh, cats, Sherry cats, and so on. Now you guys are in um, Ottawa, right? Oh no, so Ontario. In, I'm sorry. We're in, yeah, we're in London, and uh, Doug is in Ottawa. Uh, and you're in Ottawa. No, Doug. Doug is in Ottawa, and we're yeah. five hours away in London. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're in London. Yeah, that's south of Toronto, isn't it? Yeah, between Toronto and Detroit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So look, I would love to have you on the website, but but. I, I I have people on the website that just try to prevent pneumonia by using non-invasive ventilation and the cough assist around the clock when the patients, as they need it. However, I've recently surveyed all these centers on the website, and they're all telling me that they actually do extubate these people, even if they have no vital capacity at all, without trach tubes, which frankly has surprised me. I'm, I'm trying to update these centers now. Um, and I'm very happy to hear that. They're telling me, oh, you know, they're, we're doing this now, you know, you're, you're wrong and, and this and that. So um, now you did say, and it's not that I'm saying that you're wrong, but I mean, I've never had a patient electively want a trach tube. However, in the 1990s, I surveyed these 720 or 30 ventilator users. And those who went from non-invasive to trach 
uh, they came from body ventilators or they were using non invasive ventilators, but they did not have any access to a cough assist. So every time they got a cold, they were frantic. They couldn't get any secretions up and it was, you know, disastrous. Um, but if your patients have cough assist and use them at 50 to 60 centimeters of water pressure, uh, even if they do get the occasional pneumonia, you have patients that are intubated who say that they want to get trach instead of be extubated back to non-invasive support. Do you, I mean, I'm very surprised to hear that. Look, if somebody's not intubated and they electively want a trach, it usually means that they had no access to a cough assist. So, or they're on set, settings that are less than full ventilatory support. But if you're intubated uh, and somebody offers you extubation to a nasal ventilatory support instead of a trach, have you had any patient who has opted for a trach? I mean, you can fail an extubation. I've had one Duchenne fail two extubation attempts. And then I yelled at him every day. I said, this is your fault. If you'd use your ventilator, you wouldn't have to be intubated in the first place. I said, if you fail one more, I'm going to trach you. We're going to trach you. And the third time he succeeded. So it is possible, I know, to fail an extubation to non-invasive support if you don't get enough cough assist use by the family after the extubation. But I've never had a patient intubated who was offered extubation to non-invasive support who said, no, forget about it, just trach me. No, no but so I think I, we, we both agree that um, we would manage our neuromuscular patients as best we can non-invasively, yeah. including non-invasive support. Now, again, we don't use the extent of nasal mask as you do. We do use more so more oral nasal mask or mouthpiece. But again, yeah. the cough assist is very important uh, as part of their care. <laughs> Fortunately, in um, Ontario, we're able to access it easily. I just thought of something. In Europe, the big problem is, and probably in Canada too, and in many hospitals, the big problem is I don't accept a patient for transfer to extubate them unless I have uh, an agreement by someone in the family to spend the first 24 to 36 hours with the patient to use the cough assist for every desaturation below 95%. Yes, hello. Sorry, look, I'm, I'm finishing up a lecture. Uh, can you call me back in five minutes? Yeah, thank you, Anne, bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, an, it's impossible in Europe for them to do this be, because uh, the family can, is never permitted in the ICU. Uh, and uh, I think in Canada, the same thing may be true. You know, in my hospital here, the administration knows that my patients need that machine uh, immediately for any desaturation, and only the family can do that. I can't ask the nurses to do that or the therapists. The therapists come by every three hours. And the nurses, uh, the respiratory therapists don't want the nurses to do it. If you can't keep someone there to use that cough assist every 20 to 30 minutes if necessary after extubation, they're going to fail extubation and want a trach tube. Uh, and, and probably in Canada, I mean, I, that may be the problem. Is that a problem? I don't, I don't depend on the, the staff to use the cough assist after extubation. They'll never do it. Not no. enough. No, I agree. Uh, the family needs to be very much engaged in assistance um, with, re, with, with the application of this technology if they're to be able to go home and to have it applied safely as well. Anyway, those are just some thoughts for you guys. But I'd like you on the website, at least for preventing uh, respiratory failure and using 24-hour non-invasive ventilation. But if you can extubate some people who don't pass ventilator weaning parameters and spontaneous breathing trials back to what they were using, uh, that would be wonderful. And I think eventually that will be the case for most, if not all of your patients. Because the reason I got this idea to do this in the first place was because I thought to myself, these patients have been on 24-hour non-invasive support since they came out of iron lungs in 1957, let's say. And now they get intubated because of surgery and general anesthesia or a bronchitis or something. Why do they need to be traked? Why back to what they were doing for 25 years? So I started doing this in 1988 when I got that cough assist from Jack Emerson. And I discovered that, uh, yeah, uh, you know, that, that they, we can get them back to what they were doing and they don't want trach tubes. So, you know, I, that, that thought came to me. Why do they have to be checked all of a sudden now? Because they're intubated, you see. And uh, that's sort of what I discovered. And uh, it's true. They don't need to be tricked just because they're unweanable and intubated. And then, of course, we started extubating people who had never used nasal ventilation but were unweanable. That's a little more difficult because they'd never used it. But when you're intubated, 
the glottis is open. So I say to the patient, when we extubate you, we turn on the nasal ventilation, you keep your mouth shut and breathe through the nose, and you'll be fine. When you're trached, the glottis is closed. And the patients don't realize that they're not, they've lost the reflex dilation of the upper airway to breathe, which is always why it's much easier to extubate an unweanable patient than to remove their trach tube. That and the fact that they have a lot more secretions because of the trach tube. So anyway, those are a lot of thoughts for you. I recommend you get my book when I, when I can get them on the market, but please you know, contact them for me because it'll be much more expensive by the publisher. And, uh, and when I sign the book, it's a money back guarantee. I'll swear I'll send you back every pen. It's going to be about fifty dollars. I think that's all, you know. But you you will be fascinated by what they how they torture people in critical care. I mean, right now in my hospital, I have a patient that's being tortured on the trauma unit. Uh, this is a woman with four hundred to four hundred fifty milliliters of vital capacity, who had a liver transplant. Her lung compliance is poor because I think she's been underventilating for many years. And I'm not sure why, but um, she's got a trach and they're trying to wean her uh, the usual way, which is impossible if your vital capacity is under 800 milliliters. The only way she will wean is if we remove the trach tube and then uh, put her on nasal ventilatory support within one or two days, she will wean to nighttime ventilation. But with trach ventilation, she won't wean unless her vital capacity goes at least 800. And so far, it hasn't gone up in two weeks. But they keep saying, oh, she's anxious. She's anxious. She's anxious because she can't breathe. She's anxious because she's on partial ventilatory support, you know, with pressure support at 10 or PAV, PAV. Uh, and that's not full ventilatory muscle rest. So she's constantly struggling to breathe. And nobody understands that. Now, I explained it to her attending today. And, um, and the attending is going to, you know, do what I'm recommending. We're going to get a fenestrated cuff tube, then go to a fenestrated cuffless tube, Put her on nasal ventilation and then remove the trach tube entirely and manage her that way. And she will wean to nighttime ventilation, you know? So uh, the, the critical care doctors in my hospital here have been wonderful. I mean, I've been doing this since 1988, extubating unweanable people. And, and now our trauma service where they put in trach tubes, nothing but trach tubes, even they are coming around. It's only taken 34 years, but uh, even they are coming around. Well, on that note, Dr. Bach, I might uh, I might thank you. I know you have to run to your clinic and hopefully don't get uh, yeah. locked out. But it's been a, it's been a pleasure having you here. It's been uh, yeah, yeah, quite, no, no, my, my pleasure.